So, oh, hello and welcome to this conversation on the topic of creating age-friendly communities and living environments, the importance of co-production and community involvement. This being one of a number of recordings that we'll be releasing as part of our 2023 annual lectures. I'm Sanjay, the Head of Research Policy Awards at the Dunhill Medical Trust, and I'm joined in this session by a number of people, and I'll allow them all to introduce themselves shortly. But by way of brief background, we have team members from both the co-creating age-friendly social housing and developing age-friendly community Salford projects here with us today. These are two really exciting research projects that we funded as a part of our Suitable Living Environments funding call in late 2021, which sees researchers working in partnership with community organizations. And hopefully this conversation will explore to some extent what that looks like in practice. Uh, facilitating the conversation is Matthew Wynne, who is the National Advisor on Community Health for NHS England. So I'm really looking forward to sitting in on this conversation. And with that, I'll pass over to Matthew. Thanks, Sanjay. Um, great to be here and with such esteemed colleagues. Um, so I'm Matthew Wynne. I, um, as Sanjay said, uh, support NHS England, but I'm also a job in Chief Exec in the East of England uh, for my NHS organisation. Um, I'm going to just get the team to introduce themselves so you know who's around the table and I'm going to actually ask one person to bring their team in from each of uh, the areas that are funded. So I'm going to start with Andrew and the Salford crew. So my name's Andrew Park, I'm a sociologist and I'm based at the University of Salford and joining me uh, is uh, Eve Blazard. Hello everyone, I'm Eve. I'm the uh, research fellow on our project. I'm working at Salford University. And also Bernadette Elder. And hi everybody, I'm Bernadette and I'm the chief exec of a charity in Salford called Inspiring Communities Together and we're the voluntary sector partner. Great, and over to Mark in Manchester. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mark Hammond. I'm a senior lecturer at Manchester School of Architecture, which is part of the Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, I'm the, the PI on the co-creating aid for the social housing project, uh, and I'll pass over to, to Neve. Yeah, so hi, I'm Neve Kavanagh. I'm the research associate on the so, uh, co-creating social housing project, um, and I'm based at the University of Manchester. And finally, over to Shakira. Hello, um, I'm Shakira Evans. Um, I am a I suppose, community development worker with elders or with um, yeah, older people in a tower block in Manchester, and I work for Housing Association uh, One Manchester. Great. So um, really interesting territory to get through. Team, um, let's avoid any acronyms, because I won't understand what you're saying, and maybe our audience won't. Uh, fine box for every time we do that to, to be collected afterwards. But we're going to start with, um, let's start with Salford. Salford, let's just hear from you and Andrew Andrew about what's, what is your work? What's the project? What are you trying to do? So our project is... Uh called Developing Age-Friendly Communities Beyond the Pandemic. And we are exploring the ways in which the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has impacted on the ways in which older people have made connections to other people and local places. Uh, I always say that when we designed the project, we thought that the pandemic was going to be over and we now have the caveat that we are well aware that COVID-19 is still around but we've got on the project three questions we're trying to explore first of all we are really interested in how older people make connections to their environments around them second we're really interested in what has been the impact of the pandemic and public health england's response to that on how older people experience their living environments not just during the pandemic itself but also today and also how can we develop an evidence base to better support organizations going forward to develop um sort of age appropriate or age friendly communities Great, we'll unpack that a little bit more. Let's just go to Neiman, the Manchester team, and similar thing, let's set out your uh, areas of work. Yeah, so we're an interdisciplinary team, including academics from Manchester Met, uh, Metropolitan University, sorry, the University of Manchester, Greater Manchester Combined Authority, and also three housing associations from the Greater Manchester Housing Providers Group. So the project essentially is aiming to investigate how older people 
uh, social housing providers, community organisations and academics can come together and collaborate on programmes that support people, older people to age in place. So the research is based on three case studies, uh, three case study initiatives in Greater Manchester, where we had poll producing place-based um, age-friendly initi initiatives that help to address the different forms of exclusion that older residents are facing living in social housing. So the three case studies are, firstly, we have an older people's co-housing community in Old Moat uh, in Manchester with Southway Housing Trust. The second case study is focused on improvements to social infrastructure in Brunington, uh, in Stockport, and that's working with Stockport Homes. And then third and final, um, finally, the, the third case study is looking at a naturally occurring retirement community, or not for short, uh, in Hume in Manchester with our partner One, uh, One Manchester. And this will be the focus of our discussion today. We'll focus on, on that case study and I'll explain a little bit more about NOx in, in a second. But essentially, older people in each of these three neighbourhoods are experiencing different uh, local pressures and factors that are negatively affecting their lives there. And that in turn then produce or exacerbate the forms of, of exclusion and marginalisation that, that they face in their everyday life. Uh, and through developing these initiatives, we aim to investigate and evaluate what processes are needed um, for older residents and, and social housing providers to be able to work together to co-produce age-friendly programmes in response to the specific challenges in their communities. And um, so, like I say, the focus today is huge, so I'll just give you a little bit of background about that. So, the focus in this case today is around Hopton Court, and this is a nine-storey tower block built in the 1960s. So this tower block is very close to both of the universities in Manchester, so Manchester Metropolitan Unit and also the Uni of Manchester. Uh, and the block is like spatially nestled in between um, the university's campuses, but also the student accommodation that comes with the, with the university. And it's also in the midst and sort of spatially nestled um, more in the more sort of general ongoing gentrification of Hume that's been going on for decades, but that's intensified in recent years. And just to go back to the block, despite not being designed for older people um, specifically, 75% of the residents living there are, are over 50 and 96% of those are, are living alone. So that comes with its own sort of exclusionary and isolating challenges. But at the same time, there's also a strong history of tenant-led engagement and activism from those living at Hopton, uh, Hopton Court. And there's been various efforts in previous years trying to document and make visible the experiences of, of all the tenants living there. And this is um, led by a group called Hopton Hopefuls. And they try to put in place different initiatives or strategies to help address the, the exclusion that older people are facing in the block. And one of the solutions or ideas that's come out of this previous engagement work or research um, with Hopton Hopefuls and One Manchester working together is to reimagine this tower block as a retrofit retirement community or what has been termed a sort of naturally occurring retirement community. So essentially what this program is, does is it leverages a high con concentration of older adults living in one place already uh, by providing a range of integrated health and social support that is clustered around and within the existing housing accommodation that older tenants were um, have always lived. Um, and there are a range of different benefits to this, such as allowing people to age in place. And we've not got time to go into that now. But essentially, I've mentioned this because this is essentially where the, the point is the point in which we are at now in this research and in this particular case study. So we're at a point where we're trying to imagine and envision what the NOT programme is to be at Hopton. And this is where Shakira's role comes in. Acting as well, she is the development worker there, um, employed through One Manchester, but nevertheless working very much on the ground with tenants, older tenants there trying to engage different people um, and try to sort of generate different ideas about the potentialities of the NARC programme there. Um, but yeah, we can get into the details of that in this discussion. But yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> right, let's get into some discussion about those and, and share what you're learning and what you're going to learn. So let me start with kind of the partnership aspects. What does it kind of look like um, you're all quite diverse. You, you've got some really interesting di um, kind of partners in there. So let me start with Bernadette. Can what does the partnership look like in practice? How how did you get here? How did you form it? How how did how how did we get the ingredients to do these amazing different types of cakes that you're describing? <laughs> 
Um, I suppose um, we, we've got quite a long history as a voluntary sector community with the university. The university is in the heart of the community in which we work. So, you know, it's important that we have some relationship, some of it positive, some of it not so positive. Obviously, trying to mix communities and, and students isn't always a positive experience. But we've been able to work with the university for a number of years to be able to sort of have those conversations, even if they're not always positive, but to be able to work through some of those situations. Um, I went to Salford as part of a very large regeneration programme, New Deal for Communities. It was the first community-led programme and the university were heavily involved in, in that piece of work. They sat on the board and they were part of the partnership. And then over the years, as the programme started to come to an end, it was clear that the community wanted to continue to do something as part of that, that that work that had happened. So that's how our charity was formed, New Deal for Communities. And again, it was recognised that the university had a key role to play in helping to continue to shape that neighbourhood and what that neighbourhood looked like. And so we have a named person from the university that sits on the board of inspiring communities together as well. So I suppose from a strategic perspective, that that's how we sort of come together. But also it's very important that we have more of an operational role as well, how we how we support each other in what we're trying to do within that neighbourhood particularly, but also the wider neighbourhoods of Salford. So as a charity, we offer placements to student nurses who come and spend some time with us to try and understand what it's like to work within the community and how the community and what happens in the community can benefit people to age well, to, to improve their health and well-being, which is really key to, to helping people. Um, we also work with some of the students around trying to do some of their public health research and how all that sort of starts to come together. And I suppose sort of how we how we came to be involved with Andrew and his team particularly was during COVID and the pandemic. And there was an opportunity, we had a small amount of money to try and understand from an older person and a stakeholder perspective, what it was like to live during that time, what impact that was having on, on not just older people's lives, but also the stakeholders who were trying to support older people through, through that whole really bad period. And Andrew and his team came together and they did the research for us, which helped us to understand a lot about what what we're now using today, because obviously that then the Dunhill Trust program came along and it was like, oh, hang on a minute, we worked well together before. Let's see how we can sort of take that learning and actually build on it and start to continue to tell that story. And I suppose that's what we're trying to do is to continue to tell the story of older people through the lens of, of COVID, but also through the lens of where they live and what's important to them and their environments and how or has that changed over this period in time. So I suppose that's that's how our opportunity came, really. Fascinating. Thank you. R really, really great to hear. Um, Mark, um, do you want to kind of answer the kind of same question? Because it's quite different in terms of the makeup of what you've got around the Manchester area. T tell us more. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, we started from a really... Um, a really different position to, I think, most kind of co-produced research projects in that we, we were in the office twiddling our thumbs and we get an email from a community group in Hume who said, you know, we, we're a group of tenants who have already come together. Uh, you know, we would like the help of a university to make a case to our housing association about improvements. So they kind of recognise the value of research and evidence in, in kind of systems change and they wanted us to be part of that. So we we approached, we you know went to their meetings we we helped them with a report a couple of years ago by doing some data analysis and a literature review, uh, but the tenants themselves did a survey and they did all kinds of other investigations as part of it and we created this this document which was basically a case for setting up a naturally occurring retirement community project, uh, and the audience of that report was one Manchester so we, we kind of went went to them went to their directors. And it, it was a way of bringing them around the table. So at, at that point, we developed this, this collaboration. One Manchester were invested. They were interested in the model. The, the discussions then came about how we how we move it forward. Um, one of the interesting things about the naturally occurring retirement uh, model, as opposed to the retirement community, uh, is that you don't get a lot of support. There isn't, there isn't necessarily funding that, that is attached to things like extra care housing, that, which the tenants could leverage. So... We were on the lookout for funding. We got a bit of support from um, the local care organization in Manchester. Um, 
but then the the call for the Dunhill Medical Trust came along and it was it was such a good fit for what the, the group were trying to do in terms of innovating a model um, that we were in a really good position to put forward, a, I think, a quite compelling case at, at quite short notice because we've already been working with the group for a year and a half and we, we kind of developed those relationships and we already had a really strong idea of how we wanted to push it on. Um, one, one more little example, though, which I think is a really interesting kind of, yeah, it, it, it exemplifies some of the ideas about co-production was when the project started, we obviously had to recruit people to it. So um, Shakira was recruited to the role, but the recruitment process uh, was co-designed by the tenants and One Manchester uh, and a community development group who was supporting us called Community Savers. Um, so one of the tenants was on Shakira's interview panel, uh, parallel to the interview process, which was quite formal, there was a, a kind of practice based interview where uh, the applicants had to interact with tenants in a community activity and the tenants would report back to to the interview panel about their experiences, what what their rapport with the people was. Um, and it was just it was really exciting to see, um, you know, the organization come together before we'd even started, before we'd even recruited the role um, in, in kind of rethinking what that relationship was between housing association tenants and a research project um so yeah thanks it's fascinating having different people on interview panels isn't it and the and the, di and the richness you get from that um reminds me of my first one of my first jobs as a youth worker there's a young person on my panel who said um matthew um what what would you do if someone was offer uh, was about to physically be violent to you and my response not out of the playbook was get out of the way, which um, they very much liked. And I got the job as opposed to formally talking them down. Anyway, let's move on. Um, let me just supplementary question to you both. Just so people can learn, what would you have, what would you have, what should you have done more together when you set these things up? Mark, really quickly, and then Bernadette. I think... Um... I think we've been kind of learning as we go with how the relationship's going to work and and we, we're kind of identifying the power dynamics as we've moved along i think i think had we been a bit more focused at the beginning we probably might have had a smoother ride of the first few months because we were much more clearer about what was and wasn't our remit and and kind of what was and wasn't our responsibilities okay benedette anything comes to mind um, I I think really, I think because we already had a relationship, I think, as Mark says, you know, you're constantly learning and evolving and, and Eve was new to the program. So obviously, it, it probably a different dynamic came in. And, and again, that relationship that we've got with older people, we already had quite a good relationship with a quite a high number of older people in Salford through the other work that we do. But also about how do we stretch and, and reach those people that aren't reaching all the time? How do we have those those relationships between academia and the voluntary sector and and yeah I think there's there's a lot of learning that perhaps isn't part of this program that I think me and Andrew have conversations about it all the time but again you know how do we how do we get over those hurdles and how do we have those open and honest conversations rather than all being a bit polite and I suppose that's <laughs> that's something we're learning together. Okay, I won't I won't dig any further. Um, clearly a paper to be written on how to set those things up. Right, you talked about Eve and developing that approach with older people. So Eve, let me come to you. Um, how have you involved older people in what in this project? Because we often talk about co-production, but what's it meant? How have you done it? And I'm intrigued as how have you done it in a meaningful way? Yeah, I think to to sort of go over that, it would be helpful to go through the the sort of briefly the the phases of our, our research projects, and that the whole sort of approach is really underpinned by that co-production. So the, the participatory action research approach that runs through everything that, that we do. So that means that older people contribute to to all aspects of the project. So whether that be exploring the, and finding the data, taking action, evaluation, so that that meaningfulness comes that they're involved at all different stages stages and all different 
levels but what we did actually start with which sort of kind of feeds on from Bernadette's point we have five phases but we actually started with sort of a, a pre-phase an initial phase before that where that was a real opportunity for me to get out into the into the community and, and work with services and, and, and really understand what was going on but, but what happened at the same time was we ran a series of community workshops with older people um, I think it was over 100 uh, people that we engaged with and we were able to then have conversations about co-design then so what will this look like for you how do you how do you want to do this what can we do moving forward and I think that was really important to sort of kick us off that that, that started us off in that vein of, of co-production and me being really clear about what older people were, were looking for um, and then the, the sort of first sort of phase of data collection, we uh, engaged with um, 11 different organisations that support older people or develop policy to support older people to really understand uh, their position in terms of where they were through the pandemic and, and, and where they are now. Um, and we've just moved into phase two now, which is interviews with older people themselves. So that's a really important part of co-production. We're going out uh, and mapping uh, older people's social connections, but we're also doing walking interviews out in their neighbourhood so we can really go out with people in their community and really understand and see the spaces that they're living in from from their point of view but the interesting thing that sort of that runs concurrently the, the, the sort of research arm is the community development arm so we will have a, a group of like a voice and influence group of eight older people and they're going to work on a community research piece and they're going to use photo voice and film to sort of capture and, and record older people's lived experiences so that just that's that added element then to, to really bring in life to their experiences and then that group will then help us audit different activities and environments and provision of, of age-friendly service so we, we, we can really understand it from their point of view and then bring everybody back around the table and different stakeholders older people men people from the community to have conversations then about well, what does that what does that mean you know what does that audit mean what does our data mean what what do we do um, and then it, as we go into the, the sort of final sort of two phases we really want to think about quite creative dissemination that is co-produced with older people you know rather than us sort of taking those findings away it's about delivering um, you know developing those outputs with those key stakeholders so we as well as gathering the data with them we're, we're with them all the way through to sort of dissemination and recommendations at the end of the project. And Eve, just one other thing then, did, how far does that go in involvement? I mean, for instance, did, did the older people you're working with co-produce the questions you wanted to ask? Are they involved in being researchers themselves and interviewing other older people? How, how far does that go in terms of their involvement? In terms of the, the co-design, um, obviously the research focus was sort of that, that broad focus was outlined. What we were really trying to get to is what are the best ways that we can talk to people? What are the best ways that we can really capture that, like you said, that meaningful lived experience? So it was very much how they wanted to, like Bernadette was saying before, how they wanted to tell their own stories and how they wanted to be representative. And that, that's where the, the photo voice has, has really come through. That was something they were really keen to use that more sort of creative side and, and, and that visual side to, to tell that 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 story and that voice and influence group will serve as as like a, a co-researcher group um it's doing quite a lot really so it, it, that that runs alongside so that as well as that more traditional academic data gathering that we have this group of of, of older people that are working you know in that co-research way as well and i think that's really nice that we get those those two to run together but then come back into really work as a city you know not just as a project team work as a city to piece all that together to understand what does that mean for age-friendly provision what does it look like for everybody um is is the aim great thank you really helpful um co-producers sound like they need an honorary uh, university title to be offered at the end of it i look forward to seeing the pictures of that graduation uh, uh given that you're probably not paying them but i'm not sure if you are she tell me back in a minute shakira tell me how you're involving older people and embedding them into the center of what you're doing um 
Yes. So I was quite, well, not fortunate. I, the community I'm working with in terms of the neighbourhood and the block to a certain degree, I'd already been working with and volunteering with for two years previous, but yeah, mainly um, on a voluntary basis, but doing um, youth and community work and intergenerational work. Um, so I've been really lucky that I, I have quite a, a really good rapport, a, tr a trusting relationship with the tenants. And I feel that um, although my role is to, I suppose, try and be the go-between and try and get everyone to sit around the table and communicate well together is um, I'm kind of working, you know, with and, and for the residents um, and hopefully to help facilitate their voices being heard. Um, so I think the process has changed a little bit. I think they were already having meetings before I came in. They they kind of established with the help of Community Savers, their own steering group. Um, where they met and there's a few people who kind of help represent the tenants there's, there's a lot of tenants with quite a lot of high need um, or um, mobility issues but there's a few people who are maybe a little bit younger maybe like late 50s early 60s who are, are really amazing at supporting the block um, and they've been really uh, present for a lot of meetings um, but I think we've tried to strip it back now and make everything quite informal so they're really good at getting together as a community over a brew. Um, there's a caretaker's room at the bottom of the tower block where, um, you know, there's a fridge and there's a kettle and, and people tend to come in and some of them, um, the resident Joe, who comes in probably the same time every day uh, at half 10 and has a brew before he goes for his second walk of the day. Um, and so for me, that's where it's been really great to be in those spaces. And sometimes I just go and work there and, um, you know, probably don't get much work, you know, can be to work done, but um, of taking meetings to them, I think often when we do work with professionals and academics, we try and engage people who maybe are not from that background into meeting spaces or committees or, and for me, it's about humanizing meetings, I think a little bit more, not that um, uh, more professional meetings are obviously human, but, um, and sitting around the table and having a brew and a piece of cake together and doing meetings in that way. Um, so it, it feels less hierarchical. Um, and I think it also maybe helps to break down barriers with uh, professionals and tenants. Um, yeah, I think especially with bigger companies where they maybe haven't had a lot of those face-to-face -face interactions and actually got to know each other on a human level. So I think we're doing a lot more than that. They're, um, things like that. They have had a whole history of, like we were saying earlier, of barbecues and food and drinks in the sort of garden actually where the, at the bottom of the flats. And they're already doing loads of community stuff really amazingly. So for me, it's, you know, you to do community work in the way that I like to do community work is you obviously observe what, what the strengths are and what they're already doing and it's helped facilitate that and do that well. So, um, yeah, so for me, that's where a lot of the really great other work and development work can be done. So let's eat some fried chicken and, um, you know, do the mapping, look at what, like, what does age friendly mean to you? Um, getting people, so, you know, speaking to integrated services in terms of healthcare professionals, but inviting them to these spaces so people can actually sit and have some chicken together or uh, the doctor surgery across the road has been really amazing and um, they have quite good um, we have a really good relationship with them and they're really up for coming into those spaces so um, I don't know if that answers your question but yeah I suppose yeah I, I'm constantly having I suppose just because of the way I work and the relationship I have is you know we we meet for a brewer every week everywhere anyway um, either at the community centre where a lot of them attend or in the caretakers room or when the one of them is sat out in the garden or buzzing about in the there's a pub I see a couple of them at down the road um, having a pint on the mobility scooter um, yes and then having those quite informal updates rather than hey let's meet up and have an agenda. And then everyone feels more baffled at the end and a bit burnt out and quite bored um, by those meetings sometimes. So I think we're trying to do less meetings. You know, I can sometimes you know, have more of the, I don't want to say boring meetings, but some more of the other meetings, make sure they're, I'm taking their voice to the meeting. They're invited to all of them. And then I catch up them really regularly um, and invite people into their space, I suppose, yeah. 
fascinating uh fascinating insight into your wonderful life uh sounds rolling around food and hot drinks and uh chasing people around but it but that whole point of actually you know let's not take people into alien environments we want to get their views let's go to them who where they're comfortable they're safe they're going to be um which which does bring me on to um where that could i don't know i'm going to pose the question maybe to andrew first this tension of um academic rigor you know everything shakira just described i do not associate that with academia i associate that with fantastic community development and and doing things really well in a person-centered way so tell us a little bit about that kind of relationship and balance between what you're delivering from a, a university perspective underneath this uh, grant from the great Dunhill Medical Trust and how that kind of fits in with that ethos of bottom-up approach with voluntary sector and community groups. How, how, how does that work? So I guess, um, I mean, I start perhaps even by stating the obvious that, you know, universities, just like voluntary and third sector organisations, are really complex places. Um, and what universities do is is really you know, often very different to perhaps how people might perceive them to be. But as, um, in terms of this whole idea of academic rigor, and, you know, what we're trying to do with our projects is, yes, you know, gather uh, sort of rigorous um, data or evidence on people's lives. But we're also really keen that the work that we do is sort of what we call kind of impactful and relevant as well. So it's not just about doing academic research for the sake of doing academic research. It's about doing research that's got proper meaning and has got resonance and um, that can be seen as being kind of worthwhile, you know, for, for people who, whose lives are, you know, stretched way beyond the kind of university um, campus. So I think what, what we're trying to do in this research is, first of all, with the work that Eve has explained, we've been working on a one-to-one -one work really closely with different older people to really get at their experiences of their day-to-day -day, uh, lives, some of the challenges that they might be facing. But alongside that, we're working with Bernadette's team to also make sure that older people are, are involved in also contributing to that evidence base. So it's about trying to understand different sorts of data, different kinds of evidence. And really, I think our project is about storytelling and how we can gather different kinds of stories in different sorts of ways. So, you know, alongside the academic team, and, you know, I should have said at the start that we've got um, we have a partner at Manchester Metropolitan University, you can't be with us today, Anya Ahmed. We've got a really fantastic uh, community development worker, Van der Groves, who works with Bernadette's team. We've been really fortunate to have the support of groups like the Age Friendly Salford Network and Age UK Salford. And what we start to see is actually all these groups are really, really keen in not just trying to support older people but also to try to better um, develop that evidence base for what kind of works well what could be done better in the future so the work that we are collecting we hope will feed directly into the the work that Bernadette and her team are doing on the ground as well as to other kinds of organizations and also at the same time what Bernadette's team is always able to, what I'm always reminded of is that, you know, they do keep reminding us of the centrality of older people's experiences and the not to lose sight of older people and their voices, um, because that's really, you know, what we're all trying to do is just try to understand and also hopefully support and improve um, support and activities and, you know, enable older people to live as well as possible. Fascinating, thank you. And, and Neve, let me just bring you in from the Manchester team. Um, what, what what are the benefits and challenges <clears throat> that you're finding in working in this very kind of fluid and dynamic way with lots of different kind of stakeholders? Yeah, um, I think maybe the first thing to say is the thing I recognised when I started working in this role was that whilst there is all these different partners, I think the extent to which we work with them all varies and changes. So I have a lot of interaction with Shakira and residents, but maybe not other, and other people don't interact as much. So I'll probably just reflect on, on, on mine and Shakira's um, interactions up to now. Um, and I think that's another thing as well. It's like figuring out the responsibilities and the requirements of each partner and what is required of us. Uh, that's something that we're also figuring out as we go. 
but yeah, I think with with Shakira and I, I think obviously not to say the obvious, but we obviously bring different skill sets. My background is academic, where I'm used to evaluating things, capturing experiences, analysing them with social theory, sociological theory. Whereas Shakira is very much from a community development background, where she's about doing. And I think when we have these reflections meetings each week, where it seems like our, our motives aren't different, but you know, I always want to know, I think as part of the research is to try and learn about how social housing providers and um, tenants can work together. We want to understand Shakira's process um, in that role and what she's learning. Um, so, yeah, so we can write about it and know and, and share that on. But for Shakira, it's very much about doing in the here and now and what she can, what she can, um, yeah, the outputs in the here and now, which, and I think it's just about it's obviously not a bad thing. It's just about balancing that and the bringing together of different different partners. Um, but I think in doing that, at the same time, we've had we've had um, conversations about how okay, so we want these reflections from Shakira, and sometimes we figure we're trying to figure out are we asking too much of, of Shakira in one sense? So I think it's yeah, just trying to figure out um, um, yeah the different yeah just getting at the, the different the different uh, motives. Um, so I'll tell you what, I'm going to be naughty. Shakira, yeah. why don't you come in and, and say it from the other side? Was it, what's it like working with these academics, these people with multiple letters <laughs> after their name? Who, what's, what, what's it like from a community development aspect? Um, to be fair, it's right. I think, I, I, um, I think I've been quite lucky that, um, yeah, I think we work really well together. Um, has it, has it changed the way you've operated? A little bit. I think for me, it's interesting because I feel a bit like in the middle of everything. And I don't mean that in an egotistical way, but obviously, you know, I'm working with the tenants, I'm working for a housing provider, but the housing provider, there's lots of politics within and I'm kind of working, um, you know, with academia and all of them, like I say, we're, we're all working on one project, but we all, we all communicate in a different way and we all have a different agenda. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but we all want to get something out of this project. Um, and so I'm aware that, you know, I like I say, I'm a grassroots community worker. I have a background in other things, but I'm aware that in doing my work, that actually a reflective process is really useful for the work, the, the research side of things. And I'm aware that feeding back to um, my managers in terms of the social housing provider um, feeds into potentially the continuation of my job so there's like um so it does I don't think it's a bad thing I think I've had to do reflective practice previously as a youth worker we used to do a lot of evaluation work just for ourselves to try and improve practice at the end of sessions um so I find it really useful I think to because I think it only ever makes you better at what you do to to kind of uh, critically evaluate it um, and like yeah, Neve was saying, when, when you have a discussion with someone who is working on something different, but they stand from a different viewpoint, um, you're like, hmm, okay. Um, and I find that's uh, really valuable. So it's generally, yeah, it's been it's been really good. I think you know we just generally also get on as uh, as humans, so which has been quite good. But um, yeah, generally good. But I think it does obviously create. I have to be less not gung ho, but kind of like right, okay, yes, let's just do that tomorrow, and then obviously yeah, others kind of being like, all right, let's hold on a minute, let's like have a little think about this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you know, the the whole point obviously this project is co co collaboration um, or collaboration, and you know, in terms of having resilient communities and resilient societies, obviously working with people who have different views and different ways of working effectively is um, ultimately really important. Yeah, and bringing all those skills to bear on that purpose is really mm -hmm. important, isn't it? So really fascinating. So, folks, as we bring this session to a close, and it's gone by really quickly, and it's been fascinating to hear all your um, kind of comments and discussion on what you're up to. Can I pose in each of the teams a, a question? What's the those that are watching? What should they be looking out for? What's the one thing you hope to bring to everyone as a result of this project? What what, what are you really excited to say when we publish or when we when we quantify all this? What's one thing that they can kind of look forward to hearing from you about in terms of what you're doing in Salford and Manchester? Um, 
Mark, you're nodding, so I'm going to bring you in first because you clearly have something to say. What one, one thing? So, so for us, I think it's about moving the debate in the social housing sector away from how we can support older people just as new development, bricks and mortar and adaptations. I think we've got to recognise the role that housing providers have in communities uh, and the potential for them to work differently with those communities. So we're going to be producing at the end of our project a, um, a guide for social housing providers about that reflects on the three case studies that talks about how they could work with their communities, the older communities in a different way. Uh, and hopefully we'll also have some workshops uh, about that as well, which I'm sure if you are on the Dunnell mailing list, you will hear about sometime in the future. Brilliant. And Salford colleagues, who's going to come in with one thing you're excited that you're going to produce? Andrew, why don't I come to you? OK, I'll start. I think, um, you know, alongside the really exciting data and analysis and evidence base, what I really hope that we'll be able to see are the ways in which older people and a whole range of partners, different third sector, voluntary sector organisations, universities can come together, perhaps with different objectives, with different practices and ways of working, but can come together to kind of achieve a shared goal, which is really to better uh, to better understand not just older people's experiences and provide support to uh, enable them to go on living in their communities and their neighbourhoods, but also to come together to overcome all the kind of challenges and the barriers and the obstacles that we sometimes can get lost in day to day to actually think, actually, you know, we did come together to do some really good work and also to try and make a difference. Uh, perhaps, you know, what I really hope at the end of this project is that we will make a difference to older people and the people who support them, perhaps one day at a time, one neighbourhood at a time. But it's it's that small everyday level change that I can think of will be really impactful. And I hope that, you know, that's what I'm looking forward to the most. Things. Um... It is, we could go on for hours talking about this. You've got two really great projects. Um, you've taught me a new concept, naturally occurring retirement communities, um, which I hadn't heard about before. And I thought I knew a lot about older people's care, but clearly not. Um, I look forward to uh, reading exactly what you are doing, what you, Andrew and Mark, have just described. Thank you for everything you are doing in this space. Thank you to all the users and the, you know, I think we're all going to be coming to Shakira's door for, for, for chicken barbecues and cups of brew uh, up in uh, your neck of the wood. And I think I would finally say thank you so much to the wonderful Dunhill Medical Trust for both funding you all and having faith that these are the right things to test out and help learn and spread and adopt the great practice that you are all going to do. Thank you so much for your time. And I hope everybody who's listening have enjoyed it as much as I have in hearing what you're up to. Bye for now.